In 2001, cinema everywhere changed because of the release of one movie. No, I don't mean Shrek. Oh, well, actually make that because of two movies. <clears throat> In 2001, cinema everywhere changed because of the release of one specific movie that is relevant to the discussion of this video. And that movie was The Fast and the Furious. Back in the day when this movie came out, everyone and their mom lost their mind. I should know, I wasn't even born yet. The Fast and Furious franchise is often seen as an anomaly in cinema. It's a series with humble roots and ended up becoming one of the biggest franchises in all of cinema without ever planning to. 2001's The Fast and the Furious is a story about an undercover cop infiltrating the underground street racing scene of downtown LA. It's a very uncomplicated plot. Some would say it's a little too uncomplicated. But for some reason, some studio executive of a Paramount decided to say, what if we gave them a budget? These movies are sick. I don't know how they did it, no one knows how they did it. The Fast and Furious franchise is just one of the greatest things to ever happen. Anytime I talk to anybody about any of these movies, I always get the exact same response. Fast and Furious? Ooh, I don't watch those movies. They're so corny and unrealistic and they're not about cars anymore. You know what you sound like? You sound like this guy. You literally sound like this guy. These movies are dumb fun. They're corny, they're stupid, and the characters have plot armor which makes Joseph Joestars look like toilet paper. These movies are one of the few franchises that can go toe to toe in the same summer as an MCU film and still make it out the other side with a profit. It's a saga about stunts, cars, corona, muscles, and above all, family. And within that family, the most powerful character in the entire series. No, it's not Jason Statham. It's not even The Rock, nor is it Vin Diesel. That character's name is Han Lu. Now you see, the thing about Han is, he's not like the other characters. What's special about Han is, this character is so powerful that he is able to transcend death and the bounds of reality. You're gonna want to sit down for this one. Near the end of Tokyo Drift, the third movie in release, Han ends up getting killed in a car accident. In the fourth movie, Fast and Furious, Han is brought back for one scene to interact with Dom Toretto and set up his appearance in Tokyo Drift, moving up the film in the timeline of the universe. Following this, Han appears again in Fast 5, then again in Fast 6. Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift has been moved ahead in the timeline three times, all for the sake of one character. It's by the time we get to the release of Furious 7, a film set in 2013, that the screenwriter said, Alright, we had our fun, maybe it's time we let this character rest. Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift finally receives an official spot on the timeline. It takes place just a few moments before the events of Furious 7. This pushes Tokyo Drift, a movie originally set in 2006, to 2013. So now whenever you see this movie again, you can't help but think, man, Japan has really been set back seven whole years technologically. But obviously, if you've watched these movies, you would know that we're not done yet because Han comes back again in Fast and Furious 9. I'm not joking. This man cannot die. Both the fans and the studio love this character so damn much they're willing to retcon the timeline of their own universe in order to keep him around. But that's not even the best part. The craziest part about Han's whole character is that he's not even from the Fast and Furious franchise. And I know what you're saying, Jared, surely you must be joshing me. If Han isn't from these movies, then where the hell is he from? The answer, my friend, is a movie called Better Luck Tomorrow. And yes, these are actually connected. To talk about this film, we first need to understand its roots. Better Luck Tomorrow is a 2002 film which stars Pari Shen, Jason Tobin, Roger Fawn, Karen Anna Chung, John Cho, and of course Sung Kang as Han. The film was written by Fabian Marquez, Ernesto Ferranda, and Justin Lin, who is also the director of this film. And normally this would be the part of the video in which I start to tell you about his style, the development, and work present in the film, 
But in order to do that, I need you to understand that this film isn't wholly original. Rather, it's about a murder. The real life murder of Stuart Tay. Still to come on a current affair, the fatal double life of a high school genius. In the Bay Area, police believe a very dark mission was carried out by a group of teenagers. Stuart Tay was a wealthy honor roll student and a computer genius, but police believe Tay had a dangerous alter ego and was mixed up with a gang of computer hackers. In the winter of 1992, Stuart Tay, a high school student who lived in the greater Los Angeles area of California, was murdered. What you need to understand about Stewart is that he was an honor roll student at the time of his death, on track to attend the prestigious school of Princeton. He was a genius in math and computers, a boy scout, carried a 4.0 GPA, but despite his skill and intelligence, it didn't stop Stewart from involving himself in crime. He began to associate with fellow students from other county schools, 18-year-old Robert Chin Nan Chan, 16-year-olds Kern Young Kim and Abraham Acosta, and 17-year-olds Mon Bon Kang and Charles Bae Cho all of which were also on their way to attend prestigious colleges and universities. From what information is publicly available, we know that Tay used an alias to communicate with Mr. Chen. Together, the two hatched a scheme to burglarize a local computer store in Anaheim, and together, recruited the four individuals for the crime. When Chen came to the realization that Tay might have been using an alias, he and the other members of the heist feared that he would double-cross them, and the rest occurred as you imagine. Tay was murdered and subsequently buried in an unmarked grave. Tay was beat by his would-be accomplices by both a sledgehammer and then baseball bats. Remarkably, Tay did not die immediately, so Chan forced Tay to drink rubbing alcohol on his way down to the grave. Witnesses who saw the team of students digging a grave in the backyard of the Acosta residence asked about the grave. The teen's response? They were preparing to bury a large dog. Tay would be buried later that night in that unmarked grave, and the team of criminals would later drive Tay's car to the neighborhoods of Compton to give the impression of a carjacking. And then the team would attend a party and celebrate the new year. The case was later known colloquially as the honor roll murder. During his trial, Robert Chan claimed that he did not mastermind the attack on Tay and believed that if Tay wasn't killed, Chan would have been instead. But an anonymous juror was quoted later as saying, There was no doubt that he was the mastermind. He tried to lie and blame others for it. But if there was no Robert Chan, Stuart Tay would still be alive today. About a decade would pass before this crime would eventually culminate into the film we now know as Better Luck Tomorrow. And although there is debate as to the accuracy of this film, I wanted to have a conversation more about the actual film itself. The main draw of this movie is of course its story. And although it's not entirely a one-to-one -one depiction of the events, the two are very similar. For example, none of the characters in this film shared names with their real-life counterparts, and the film ends rather ambiguously as to whether or not the teens get arrested or not. And there are, must be a lot of other comparisons, but I don't feel like I'm entirely qualified to make those. I reached out to one of the men involved, Mr. Kern Kim, and asked for an interview with him. Unfortunately, all he was able to actually tell me was, much has been said about the veracity of the movie, along with disputes as to whether or not the film is actually based on the case. In preparation for this video, I watched a lot of news segments from the time, I read a lot of news articles from that era, and I read the Wikipedia and even tried to get in contact with Mr. Kern Kim himself. But whether or not this film reflects the events that transpired accurately is completely up in the air. My hope with this video is specifically to highlight the themes and examine a movie that I really enjoyed watching. The film holds up pretty well, and while it's not nearly on the same scale as any other stuff that Justin Lin has ever worked on, it's a pretty solid addition to an early catalog in his life. The movie follows Ben, who is an honor student on his way to a bright future. He is of course surrounded by other fellow overachievers, all of which happen to be Asian Americans. His friends Virgil, Virgil's cousin Han, and the over-overachiever Derek. Ben does good in school, he's involved in multiple extracurriculars, he does sports, and has a crush on a cheerleader. Ben is literally your average Asian American kid. Ben and his friends all begin to commit felonies. They start off with stealing answer sheets, which snowballs into stealing computer parts, which then becomes selling drugs. And they get away with it, because they do well. No one pays them any minds because they're outstanding Asian Americans. Some would say, a model minority. But even as Ben tries to pull himself away from this life of crime, he's pulled back in the name of a big score. One of the more mediocre conflicts Ben has to deal with is the fact that the cheerleader he has a crush on is actually dating another guy at a different school. And that guy is Steve, 
Steve tells a team of young criminals about a job which involves robbing his parents' house. Of course, the team is very uneasy about the idea of robbing Steve's parents. They don't like this, and they don't appreciate the disrespect and obnoxious behavior he's displaying. So one of the teens proposes teaching him a lesson. On the night of New Year's Eve, the teens call Steve to a house of an associate, and they begin to beat him up. But amidst the struggle, Shit! a gun belonging to one of the teens goes off. And the rest happens as you probably imagine. They dig up the backyard, they bury the body, abandon the car in Compton, and attend a New Year's Eve party. There's something about this movie that other coming-of-age films just don't have, and I think part of it is that central theme. Better Luck Tomorrow deals with a theme many coming-of-age films never bother themselves with. And to quote the movie, it's about breaking the cycle, or in this case, breaking free of the model minority. The myth of the model minority is something which affects the characters in this movie, and continues to affect children, teens, and adults to this day, usually finding itself tied to the Asian American community. It is never named, it is never brought up, but it is the central theme. Asian Americans are stereotyped by many as outstanding citizens who are smarter than others, more talented than others, and are polite, quiet, and hardworking. And many perpetuate this stereotype believing that that is a good thing. That we should be proud as Asian Americans to be the model citizens others aspire to be. The myth is a backdoor which lets grandiose delusions about members of this community in question slip through. Expectations of those who believe in the model minority myth dehumanize people who don't fit the mold. Individuals are meant to be perfect. If they are not, they are worthless. Meanwhile, the myth itself undervalues those who aren't a part of the minority. As if we are what black, native, or Hispanic Americans must aspire to become. The film explains literally to its audience that there is no model minority. Asian Americans are just as prone to criminal activity and losing their way as anyone else is. The teens of this film plotted to commit crimes because they make up for it in education and their studious natures. They know that no one is going to pay attention to them, but in real life it doesn't work that way. And we know this. With a surface level understanding, this film makes the Asian American community look bad. A group of bright and young men committing crimes because they know they can get away with it. It's easy to misconstrue the film as a harmful depiction towards the community, making us look cocky, deceitful, and criminal. But look a bit deeper and you'll find a whole new narrative. Aside from the themes, the film just stands on its own. The characters are charismatic, the energy is young, the cinematography is superb, and the story is complex. And that emotion? It's impactful. What Land and Company were able to do with Better Luck Tomorrow speaks to an entire community who suffer from a struggle which can often feel specific to them. It's a kind of movie where the protagonists commit unspeakable acts, but in the end you understand why and how they got to where they did. 20 years later, Better Luck Tomorrow stands out as one of the best coming of age films, and technically, the best Fast and Furious film today.